Thanks for joining us for the message. We see this as the central part of our worship service. We'll have someone from our congregation read the passage and jump right into the text. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Good morning. Good morning. And Merry Christmas. You can blame it on the, the, the guy next to you. Just, er, just turn around and look at me. <laughs> well, we come to this subject, which is an amazing subject. The advent that uh, he draws near in love. And we were able to draw near to him. So as you look here... What do you see? What do you see? They call this a crash. Did I get that right, Craig? I think it's, a, it's what they call a crash. It's a, on a table, a small picture of a larger scene that has been painted for us and that we have seen pictures today of, of the manger and probably inside some part of a cave with animals and we think of that larger picture of all the things that are going on. And what do you see? What do you contemplate and think about? We have four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and typically we're going right to Matthew or to Luke because it is so descriptive of the star and the angel and the announcement and the shepherds and coming to the manger, and Joseph, and Mary, and the baby, and then later on, the wise men, all that is going on. And we have nativity scenes, and we, we speak about these things, and we go to these particular texts. But not often to the Gospel of John. <laughs> and that is what Josh read this morning. And that's where I'd like for us to turn, because we find not so much the picture of all of these events, but the meaning of these events. What does this mean? And so we call that the context of it. John 1 through 3, in fact, you could go all the way back to Genesis because he's going to mention creation and look forward all the way to Revelation because it comes right here to this scene. What do we see? 
the very beginning, it says, in the beginning was the Word. And there, it's capitalized in your Bible. In the beginning was the Word. In other words, God is already there. The <coughs> Word is already there. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So that establishes that God and Jesus are one. This is deity. And then it, you come down to verse 14, and it says, The Word, capitalized meaning Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, in other words, we see his glory, God's glory in the face of his son in this child. And it's an amazing thing. This little child, we see in its face, this innocent face, the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? How does that impact my life? And of course, we read on through that chapter and then the second chapter, and we move on to, to me, the greatest expression of the love of God. The greatest expression, this is what I would like to establish this morning, is the greatest expression of the love of God. And that is what we need to see. A lot of us struggle with God's love. You say, well, why would we struggle with God's love? Well, because certain things happen in your life. And you wonder, how could, how could God's love be consistent with that? If God loves me or this person, or if he says he loves this world, then how could God allow such things? And we struggle with it. All through life, we will struggle with that. But I believe this, that God's love, it is the most significant attribute that he has. We could list many. He's holy, he's just, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. But all the theological works have been given to us describe all that God is. But I think above all of these, and this is probably through time that I've come to this conclusion, nothing is more glorious than this expression of the love of God. He has drawn near to us in love. He tells us this in a bold declaration. He shows it in the way he lives, and he offers this to us. So he draws near, offers his love to you. The primary text that was at the very end of our reading is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is probably the most familiar verse in all of the Bible. It is probably the most overlooked. I don't know that I would treasure any other verse over this one. It brings everything together in the love of God. The first sermon I ever preached was almost 50 years ago. I know that shocks you. It was John 3.16. And I have not lost the wonder of that verse. In fact, I feel that more deeply now than ever in my life. And I believe the love of God is probably what people need to hear about more than anything else. It doesn't compromise anything else that God is, that he's just and holy and righteous and he judges the earth. But all of these things are consistent with his incredible expression of love to you. And this morning, my desire is that you see God's love for you. And that you feel God's love for you. This gives us, this picture gives us insight into the heart of God. So I ask you this question. What do you see? The first thing we see is that God is love. 
He states that in 1 John 4, 8, same writer. He says, God is love. How do you else do you define it? He is love. And it sums up what he is. And we love him because he first loved us. You realize this? You would have, if God did not love you, you would not have any capacity to love. To love him back, to love others, to love anything. It is because of the overflow of the love of God for you that you have any capacity to love. So we love him, we love his word, we love others, we love the truth. Some people say, well, it's not all about love, 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 love. You know what? It's, um, don't you need to hate some things? Well, you know, Proverbs tells us if, if, if you love what is true, you hate what is evil. So it takes care of that. If, if you love God, you love everything he loves. And you hate anything that would come between you and God. And so it is complete in what it brings to us. It is what Jesus later on in his teaching would say, the great commandments, you sum up all the commandments of the Bible. Is this, to love the Lord with all your heart. The second commandment is like it. You, you love your neighbor as yourself, but everything flows from loving God back. It is the supreme motivation. It is the supreme goal. It is the supreme response to what he has given to us. God's love to you. Three things. It's your security, it's your identity, and it's your responsibility. When I say security, the fact that God loves you makes you secure. It's not your love or ability to hang on to him, because that's imperfect. But when God has loved you, he has made you secure. It's also your identity. The love of God, it brings me into his family and I am known as his. It is the mark of my life. And it is also my responsibility. So when God loves me, what he wants is for me to love him back. That's true worship. That's what he wants. God loves you, and he wants you to love him back. And live as the primary motivation for all that you do out of love. You know, there are a lot of ways we could get fired up and motivated and do things. Many reasons. Could be pride. Could be um, fear. <laughs> there are a lot of ways you can get fired up to do something, but there is no pure motive for any action in your life than love. And it all flows from God to you. You know, there are lots of kinds of love. In English, we have one word. We use it for everything. You know, I love Colorado, love pizza, love the Broncos, love my wife, love God, love church, love my grandkids. The Greeks would have four different words. And they, they would mean different things. Could be relational type, could be marriage, could be something that you love. But agape, agape love was introduced new to our New Testament writings in the Greek. And agape love is different than any other kind of love. I want you to see this because the way that God has loved you is incredibly unique. The first thing about agape love is it, it, it's initiated. For God so loved. In other words, God initiated all of it. It wasn't a response. You know, most of the time we love stuff that gives us something. You know, I like this, so I love it. Or I, I, you like me or love me, I love you back. And so most of the time for people, love is a responsive behavior. But God has initiated it. And agape love that comes out of my life is initiated. Nothing needs to prompt that. Secondly, agape love is sacrificial. It gives up something. And most of the time, we like to get something. Our love is, the, the, the love we want is feeding me. But the kind of love that we're talking about here is sacrificial. It gives up. And third, it is unconditional. Completely unconditional. 
So he did this loving us and the spillover to our lives, loving him back and all of our relationships is that kind of love. It, and it is so different than every other religion, every kind of moral group, any kind of good advice. Nothing can compare to this. You look at all of the books, and, and it's a list of rules of do's and don'ts. It's a list of do this, do this, do this, and maybe you'll get to heaven someday. <laughs> this isn't what he describes. His love, he initiates it, he sacrifices, it is unconditional, it is complete. So God is love. The second thing that I want us to see is that God has expressed his love. He's shown us his love. In, Rome, in the book of Romans, in five, verse five, chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So most of you probably know this verse, John 3, 16, right? I mean, if you haven't seen it, look in the end zone of NFL football game, you'll see it on John 3, 16. And it says, God so loved the world. And that's a pretty good translation from the Greek to the English. But if we were really to get the meaning of it, we would say it this way, God loved the world in this way. So when he says, God so loved the world, in other words, here's how he loved the world, that he gave his only son. Here's how he did it. His love has already been defined. He is love. He's described by many passages of scriptures, but he demonstrates this to us. No greater love, John 15, verse 13 says, no greater love is there than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I read a lot of war history, and one of my favorite stories is reading about the life of Robert J. Miller, who probably most of you have never heard of, but he, he applied to the Naval Academy and was turned down because he was colorblind. You get turned down for a lot of things when you when you apply, and so he joined the Army and worked his way through to be in Special Forces, Green Beret, was sent to Afghanistan, and as a 24-year-old, he is point man for a group of Green Berets. There are 15 other Afghans, and they're sent to rescue a village that's deep into enemy territory, and he's at the point. They're going through one of these valleys, <clears throat> And all of a sudden, fire comes down of, of bullets and bombs and missiles on them, and everybody is in a panic. And the captain who's behind him orders everyone to retreat. And, and Robert is thinking, if, 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 I tr if we all turn around and start running, we're going to be slaughtered. And so he is a, is a weapons specialist. He grabs his gear, and he runs into the enemy. <clears throat> I think, it's just, is that crazy or what? No. But what he's done is, is, is he is providing cover by firing grenades and shooting his rifle and then radioing back the enemy position. And every single person, the Americans on that team, the, seven, the, the 15 Afghans and, and the seven Americans, all were able to retreat to safety. And he stayed there, keep firing, firing, until finally his radio went silent. You know, think on that, that story to me is moving. I mean, it's just moving. It's just about you know, three years later, that this happened in 2008 and 2010, he received the Medal of Honor, and he should have. You think what someone would do for his comrades. And, and Jesus, in a sense, has done that for us. And so much more. And so, when I say so much more, because he has done that not for 15 or 24 or, or a group of people. He's done that for the whole world. And drawn on himself the enemy fire, all of the hostility, and took it upon himself. That's the kind of love. And it was motivated by love. That's why when we read John 3.16, for God loved the world in this way. 
he gave his only son, his only son. And then finally, God is loved because he expresses his love in an offer. So that they might have eternal life. Not perish, but have eternal life. You know, I think of everything you read, every sermon you hear, you get to the end, you ask the question, so what? <laughs> so what? John 3, 16, so what? Here's what. If you believe this, if you receive this, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a promise that comes from God. He did all the work out of love for you. All your sin he took on himself to provide your freedom. You know, I think that it's a gift. You talk about the gift of eternal life. There are many gifts that come with Christ, but he is the gift. God's gift to us is his son completely. And he says, I offer it to you. There are many things we learn about God. He would go to this measure to provide for you eternal life with him, the forgiveness of sins in a future. He, he, he does this out of love. And he waits for a response. You know, we'll probably tonight, how many of you open up a gift on Christmas Eve? You do that? Some of you do that? You know, we got to wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> but when you're handed a gift, you don't try and pay for it. I mean, that would be insulting to the person who did that for you. It was paid for. It was paid for. It did cost something. It was a gift. So heaven is a free gift from God, paid for by the blood of Christ, offered to you, handed to you, handed to you. You say, well, how could anybody say, no, thank you, or just let it sit there? But that choice is given to each of us to receive. God is not willing and not desiring that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. Did you know that God desires for every person to come to him in salvation and to have eternal life and to be with him forever? God desires that, and he has paid the way, and he has provided it, and he has offered it. Isn't that beautiful? This is all the love of God given to us, our security, it becomes our identity, and it becomes our responsibility to love him back. What do I do with a gift? You say, well, what hoops do I have to jump through? Just this, thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for giving your son for me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. I accept this gift. That's all. The only way to come to God is in humility. It doesn't need to be a fancy prayer. As I've said many times, you're, you're looking at me. Um, you can pray right in your own heart before God. Lord, I receive this. I, I take this. I believe this. I accept this. So when we come here this morning, what do you see? What do you see? God is love. He rescues us. He redeems us. He restores us. And he gives us every reason to live. He has drawn near. He has drawn near in love. And we can draw near to him also in love. Say, so you spend time talking this morning. What's the one thing you want people to see? God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. 
every moment of every day, in every circumstance, when you doubt, when you fear, when you wonder, he loves you. He will always love you. You know, that, to someone who's never come to Christ, that's a great invitation, isn't it? But I'm speaking to a lot of you who are Christians. You have put your faith in Christ. You have, you have believed on him and been saved. You've been born again. Praise the Lord. That praise the Lord. But can I challenge you today, this coming year, to live in wonder of the love of God in your life. To live in wonder of his love for you. And to enjoy it and to express it and to share it like never before. Draw near. Let's bow together as we pray. It's a marvelous thing, Lord, a wonderful thing, glorious thing. God became flesh and lived among us as a little baby, we behold the glory of God. And more than anything else, through all that we read, we see your love. So perfectly demonstrated to us and offered to us. Father, I pray for every person here today that they this year would live in the state of being overwhelmed by your love. That you would remind them of that every day and that their life would reflect it by experience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This Advent season, we have celebrated that hope has come. We have celebrated that peace has come. We have celebrated that joy has come. And we've celebrated that love has come. So the last thing we do this morning, we celebrate at the center of it all that Christ has come. That Jesus spoke these words to his disciples and he said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We draw near. Christ has come. So we invite you this morning to draw near to him because he has drawn near to us. He has placed that light inside of us and this morning we invite you to take your candle and light your candle the light that has been given in your heart and join us as we sing at the end silent night listen to jesus words to his followers you are the light of the world a city situated on a hill cannot be hidden no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and gives it light for all those in the house. We raise our candles this morning in the same way. Let your light so shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Stand with us as we sing. Join us in silent night.
not regular here from visiting out of town. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope you have a very blessed Merry Christmas uh, with family. And as we conclude, I read this benediction out of the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you.